Hello and welcome everyone to Digitales, episode 12, season 2. My name is Fazan Sayed, founder and CEO of East River, and today I have a very well known face, Faran Tahir, who is a Hollywood actor of Pakistani origin. He has been in a number of famous movies. You've probably seen him in Iron Man, The Escape Plan, Elysium, and even Star Trek. And what's interesting about him is that not only is he an actor in Hollywood, but he's also done undergraduate and a master's degree, Berkeley for undergrad and Harvard for grad, a master's degree in the performing arts. So he's someone who's rounded out the arts, delivered on the arts in a career in Hollywood, and now is in Pakistan looking to get into theater and a number of new projects. How are you, Farhan, today? I'm very well, and thank you so much for having me. I'm humbled and honored for one thing. And now my big fear is that with this wonderful introduction, I hope I can live up to it. <laughs> well, you've certainly been doing a good job all these years, so I'm sure you'll be fine. You've been very active in the theater scene in the last few years. Tell me after the, the movie stint, what have you been up to? Well, you know, what, what I have always tried to do is keep all of these things alive you know, film, television, theater, because from, from an artistic perspective, it feeds me in different ways. So that's exciting for me to keep me involved and, and, uh, and focused. But what I've been trying to do really is that with, you know, with God's grace that some of my projects have done well. Mm -hmm. And I've taken that, that platform and then tried to to construct on it, to build on it. Uh, so what I have done is that not only I started off obviously as an actor, which was my base, but I've moved into direction, I've moved into production, I've moved into content creating, uh, trying to figure out what are the trends and how we can best use those trends to our advantage. So I've, I've expanded my, my horizons in a way and also my scope. Uh, right. of the work that I'm doing. So that involves, that involves, obviously, I've done, you know, decent amount of films. I've done television series. I've done theater. I'm about to go do something on Broadway uh, in, uh, in, in the near future. So all of this to me is, is a really good way to keep our finger on the pulse for one thing. Okay. And start looking for advantages where we can find some. Because I think the other thing that we need to do, as, as you mentioned, that I've, I've been frequenting Pakistan more. Correct. And I think it is, it is important for us that we as Pakistanis also start to prepare ourselves for the global market. You know, we, we do really well in the domestic market. But how do we expand our, our offerings? Uh, because obviously there's a monetary gain that's involved with that, but there's also a larger gain, which is of changing people's minds about who we really are. So one of my biggest things right now is that rather than trying to disprove the narrative that others have created for us, right. let's create the right narrative and be judged on that narrative rather than always playing the, the defensive game. You know, so, so let me ask you this. Let me ask you this, and sure. I think this ties in. You know, you you've had experience in theater, and typically when we thought of media and content, we've always thought of theater, film, and television. Sorry, theater, television, then film. Right. And now, in the last, let's say, five six years, not even like maybe a few a few a number of years, especially with sort of the way digital is proliferating, we hear the word content, content mm -hmm. creation, mm -hmm. content creators content amplification, we hear that word a lot. What to you, as someone who studied this, participated on both sides of it, what is the difference to you of content versus film theater and let's say movies and TV? That's a very, that's a very good question. And I think, I think uh, the reason that the word content is coming up more, I think also has to do with the fact that there has been such an explosion of social media. Not only that, then we also have to look at realities. For example, COVID has also pushed us and challenged us in this industry to right. find newer ways to monetize our content and also offer our content. So I think that's why we are moving away from the traditional words as film, television, theater. And it has become more about 
creating content because now that that one restriction that we might have had in in the past that a movie needs to be at least 90 minutes or a tv show needs to be at least an hour we don't have those restrictions anymore because because the we're bound by traditional tv schedules or we're not bound exactly, by exactly. cinematic requirements in theaters and so on that and at the same time we also understand we need to understand that at times the audience's attention span might not be of of that stretch that you might need so you make smaller content you see so i think we are obviously every industry is but i think we are also going through an evolution right now right. and a lot of old systems are now have to be reexamined for example now in the us there was a time when we used like movies like iron man star trek you know the big movies when we opened them on 3000 screens mm-hmm. we would call it a big opening but given given the re- realities right now people are not going to the theater or, or right. to the, to the, to cinema anymore so we have to also redefine ourselves and figure out the newer ways of of offering monetizing sharing content creating content and all of that so i think it's it's an exciting time in a way so it's for, interesting for you say this i i actually watched two movies just this past week and after a very long time and one was the story of gucci and one was uh the james mm. bond film which was out a year ago i think it got delayed but i found interesting on both they right. were very long they were almost nearly 3 hours long which typically i remember was you know the older longer feature films like the godfather you know you used to invest 3 hours in watching that really long movie you know so i started wondering are films then going to become these let's say 2 to 3 hour long projects and tv shows are now running 60 minutes because you can consume it on digital without ads mm-hmm. and then you've got the short form content that is the social media content i mean are we sort of testing the the boundaries of what people are considering as content and is this happening Absolutely globally or because I, i i think it's happening globally because i think our markets now are not are not restricted by geography you see so a couple of things that are happening because of that what is what it is also doing is that it is pushing us to create a certain quality of content you know when things were more geographical and the exposures were not as big we could get away with a lot of stuff right but now audiences are much more savvy because they they're seeing work from across the world and they can pick and choose the content they want to watch that explains so, the korean drama craze people are watching those dubbed in urdu exactly and and that's my that was the other point that i was going to come to that because of that because things are evolving so for example until a, a while ago language was an issue that it's a foreign language film it's a foreign language content do i want to watch it do i not want to watch it blah 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 i need to be a certain st- state of mind to be reading all those the 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 captions at the bottom whatever as time has gone on and let's bring in the whole covid situation if you look at it and if you go to like netflix now the the language barrier is no longer a barrier you know you, people are watching money heist and squid game and and you know content from south asia and and from africa and all that because now content is king language all of those things are not as big of an issue where where relatability might be a factor now i think what is happening is that if you look at the trends what people want to watch is content with with universal storylines mm. but framed in specific uh in a specific way for example yes there could be a story about a a family that's dealing with the the a terminal illness of a child let's say there's a content about that right that's a universal story anybody can relate to that it doesn't matter what color what creed what religion whatever but what is unique now if we are doing it in pakistan we will put that indigenous platform and the frame around it it has it has 
two advantages. One is that it makes it unique. And secondly, it makes it human. People can relate to it regardless of the frame that you're putting it in because there's a, there's a universal connection to the, to the story. So that's what I'm seeing a lot, that it doesn't really matter anymore if the content is, is in, in a different language or whatever, as long as relatability is there. So it's basically so it a return to the core of storytelling. And, and, and so storytelling focused on the audience needs, which could be either fill a five minute need, fill a 15 minute need, or fill, let's say a three hour need, depending on how much time the audience has, and then deli deliver that, that content or that story using the right platform to fill that need and exactly and, and, and i think that's that is what's happening the conventions are breaking for like 20 years ago 30 years ago when if you were working in the us you only had the networks right Correct. and the networks would have to then cater to the entire country <laughs> so the so content like the was, exactly so the content wasn't brave it was it was safe now the advantage that we have is that we can seek out the content that that speaks to us rather than content being shoved down you know our throats because that's all you have but so the problem I think is that algorithms sitting inside netflix and all the ott platforms force you to see content that you are more likely to watch right so if let's say someone is into action film netflix will show them more action content yeah, right, right, right. so Technically, that problem still isn't solved because they're still showing is, some content that... And yet, and yet, but I mean, you can go on Netflix and they will show you based on what you have watched. They will make you, they can give you recommendations. But by the same token, you have the freedom of scrolling down. You know, if, if like I, I love watching action movies, you know, whatever. Right. But, you know, but there's, there's a whole section which is about rom-coms. So right. what I'm saying is that there, that there is the availability of so it's there you just have to hunt for it versus before you have to it wasn't there at all it wasn't and and the thing that i think people forget in my businesses that in most businesses the model might be that you supply demand right right in our in our specific industry we have a unique advantage we actually at times create demand and then and then supply it. How is that? How does that so, work? So what I'm saying is that look, we can we can create demand by by offering more stuff and varied stuff because it is a it is an ongoing uh, process of people's uh, palates, their intellectual palates expanding, right? Mm -hmm. For example, you know, I'll give you an example of Pakistan, you know. Here, the content, as much as we want, is, is very limited in its, in, its, in its offering. You know, we are not experimenting with genres. We are not experimenting with storylines. They're very, very, you know, they are what they are. Very cool. And they have and been for and a while now. Vicious cycle. That's a total vicious cycle because the content creators say that that's what the demand is. Correct. But... The problem is that unless we give them more variety, how is there going to be a demand if they have not been able to watch that? So in my industry, how do we create demand? If, if you expand my industry, there's a fashion designer who puts out a line and, and decides that these are the, like the pink is the new black or whatever, you know? They create a campaign which subliminally then enters the, the consumer's mind and they start to think that yes, this season, pink is the new black. So I must go out and purchase it. So that's what I'm saying that in, in the industry that I am in, we can create demand and supply it. So that, that also puts a, a huge responsibility on us that we create quality, hopefully, that we create quality content, which is diverse, which, is, which fills needs of different demographics demographics of different people mm -hmm. so it's it's for it's, it's it's a very it's a very different kind of an industry we also work in an industry which is based on opinion one mm -hmm. of the things that i always say is that we live in in a time right now where wars 
are won and lost in media before they're ever fought on a battlefield. Because the war of opinion has become the key uh, to a lot of it. perception has become a, a big factor in, in how things are conducted. And we, in our industry, we are the ones you can call us guides or manipulators or whatever you want to call us of these, uh, you know, of these, of these trends and of these demands and, 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 and this kind of content creating. So you're saying that countries should invest in actors and uh, TV channels instead of investing in tanks and armies? Man, I, always, <laughs> always. You know, we, uh, you know, on on a larger on a larger note, you win the war immediately. <laughs> <laughs> so tell me, you work, you've, you've spent time in Hollywood. You've worked on a number of big budget films. You work with some big name actors. How how is that industry as a place to work in coming in as you know, someone sort of not from that industry, someone with a minority right. background. I mean, is it different? Is it the same? And, you know, we see that typically there's a certain type of role that's given to a certain type of individual, right? Mm -hmm. What's your view on that, having spent time there firsthand? Well, I will say, you know, and, and I'm not saying that my struggle was unique and special and nobody else has gone through. Everybody in this business have, have gone through some real struggles. But as far as I'm concerned, one of the biggest struggles that I had when I started, and I won't date myself by saying when, but a long time ago. But one of the, one of the biggest problems that I had was because I was of Pakistani origin. And yes, here I, I come from, I'm blessed to come from a family which is steeped in this. But when I went to the U.S., I had absolutely no one to turn to that I could relate to. There were no South Asians who could men mentor me or who could tell me, do this, don't do that. So I had to chart my way almost in darkness and by trial and error find my, my footing. In that, I think that the next question that, that, that I have faced and people of... of what one could call ethnic background, although I hate that word. Everybody has an ethnicity, but mm -hmm. they label us that way. That there is, there are times when there is content being offered to you which limits your ability to not only perform, but also to show true the, the true character because it is being written by people, not always for nefarious reasons, but because there's lack of information. What, so do you mean by, what do you mean by lack of information? Lack of, yeah. So look, I, I'll give you a very simple example. Because we are not, as, as South Asians or whatever, we are not really engaging with the world to show them, as, as I said earlier, that we are, de we are depending on the narratives that people have created for us. You see, we haven't done, because we also have to take responsibility in this. We haven't done enough to give newer, fresher, different narratives so that their minds can also expand. A guy sitting in America, his exposure to a South Asian is what? It is, the, you know, we are, we are doctors, we are engineers, we are also Uber drivers, we are also working in convenience stores. So, so their, their exposure to us is limited. And right. they're basing their, their storylines and their and their narratives based on on the limited exposure that they have with us, and that exposure is based on their when they need when they need to get in touch with us. So we are not offering anything more than that. So, so when they happens, need, what, when they need a service, they call a let's say a driver or a doctor or a cabbie or whatever it is, right? So the, we end up we end up being the face of service provision in, exactly, in the market, exactly. right? Exactly. So, so they don't understand, and rightly so, the layered people that we are, right? So the challenges that I had was that, yeah, there were times when I was being offered stuff which ran totally against my own grain. But in those moments, I always say that that power of decision lies with me. 
I don't have to take every role that comes my way. Right. Right. Yeah, it might be a kick in the wallet, but right. if I can't if I can't face myself in the mirror in the morning, it's not really worth you know just going for for the for the green at that point. So that responsibility and that 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 charge is solely with me. By the same token, there are times when you when you do take roles which might at times look like stereotypical. Yeah. But then my then my responsibility is how do I make it human? How do I make it con connectable? So how what do you're I trying to do is say that ethnicity, leave that aside. We're all humans and we're all connected and we all have the same experiences, we all have the same problems. We should see past that and bring that to the role. Yes, sure. And and in that, what, what what does happen is that you have to you have to be very smart about it because when you when you challenge people on on a certain on a certain thing, if you don't do it in a constructive way, if you do right. it in a combative way, it's it's then it's not a dialogue, then it's a series of monologues. If you and I are on the opposite side of an of a of a topic, what generally happens these days is that while you're giving me your side of the thing, I'm already thinking of the rebuttal that I'm going to give you. I'm not listening to what you're saying, so it's not a dialogue happening. It's it's a series of monologues that's happening. Two so people are preparing that. monologues. One's delivering one, one's preparing one. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and, then, and, then we, and then then we pat ourselves on the back and say, you know, I said my piece, and yeah. nothing is resolved. Yeah. So I'll give you an example. I'll give you an example that I give a lot, that when I did Iron Man, you know, yes, he was a bad guy, and all of that, fine. You know, there there is some deliciousness as an actor to play a bad guy because right. it gives you a lot of freedom to have fun. Yes, right. I wanted to do it, but at the same time, I when I started to read the script and when I started to see the production, there were there were some, I would call them little red flags, that I could see. For example, that in in some of the scenes, the the writing that they had used in the back. Of course, they went to Google and they looked at whatever looked like Arabic or do writing. They just took it. But there were verses from the Quran, mm -hmm. right? Now that gives a very different kind of a message to the world. Right. So I had to go to them and I, I went and I, I had a conversation with them. I said, look, I know that this is not happening for any deliberate reason because you're trying to embed some, some you know, hateful message in there. Right. But what I'm seeing is that by if we do this, it will create that that ill will. So let's look at that. Let's also look at the fact that this bad guy that you that you want me to play. Why are we basing his evil in faith? Okay. So, you know, so my, my point is that when you have a constructive conversation where yeah. people don't have to put up their guards and feel threatened. That's when you make you make uh you make you affect change right and that has been that has been something very central to to how i have conducted myself which is that when there is an opportunity let's take that opportunity let's engage people in in conversations so that we can all expand our minds and find a better way of being and uh, Iron Man is a very good example of it, that a movie which is, you know, where the budget is, what, $200 million, $150 million. Mm -hmm. To be able to have that conversation at that level and affect, even if it's a small change. Right. That's a huge thing. And we need to look for those opportunities. And that's when we have to be a little, a little bit more altruistic than right. selfish. You know? That's true. So, so those are the kind of things that, that, that help us a lot. And that is exactly why I tried to create a career which is as diverse as, as I possibly could make it. I, as an actor, I don't want to just play only Pakistani-American roles. Right. right. I need to also satisfy and be fair to my personal uh, you know, endeavors also. So it, it, it's a delicate balance that you have to keep. So you, one thing I wanted to ask you, you've worked in, in Hollywood, you've done some theater here, you've spent time in Pakistan. How far behind is our industry relative to theirs? Well, well look, I mean, 
let's let's be honest you know and objectively i ask objectively only because yeah, I, so yeah it allows us to really think through of okay what are the building blocks we need to lay out mm-hmm. and how do we create a pipeline of talent that can stand on these blocks and maybe we won't get there in the next 5 years but at least we create a vision where our side you mentioned this right that our story should be told the right way Exactly, and when exactly. the boundaries are breaking down of, uh, let's say, international mediums, then maybe we finally have a chance of telling our story. But the problem is we don't have any storytellers. Exactly. See, I think I think, and you're right. I think the, well, let's be honest. I mean, that's a very well-established industry, yeah. so they have the means, the resources, and the structures. Yes, we get that. But yeah, you're right. I think if if we look at where our industry is right now, you know, uh, to be very honest, and I'm I'm not saying this in a in a negative way, but I think we are in a very confused place. You know, we we are not confused culturally, confused with what we want to achieve in, in, in many ways. So l- let's let's take a step back. The thing that I'm realizing in Pakistan a lot is that especially our younger generation, and it's not their fault, it is ours. I think we are not, we are losing our own identity. When I speak to young people, and if I talk about Urdu literature, it can only go as far as Iqbal, Manto, and Fez. You see? So, so our own knowledge of our own, of our own histories is not there. So when we as artists try to get inspiration from the outside, if we don't know our identity, if we don't have a very clear prism through which this information can refract, it only becomes copying and plagiarism because it is not refracting. Our, our prisms are not rich enough to refract it the right way. So what do we do? I think few things that I'm seeing where there are huge gaps is that as far as our training, knowledge, and our resources are concerned, we are still way behind the rest of the world. We need to prepare our artists so that they can hold their own no matter who they face. And they should not have the disadvantage of having lack of of technological knowledge or the artistic ability to express, express themselves. So yeah, you're right. I think one of the biggest things here is that I don't think that the right kind, not right, but diverse kinds of content are being written. And when they are being written, because there's no formal understanding of how to write it, people are just doing it out of the love and passion that they have. But that love and passion has to be directed. We have to give them the right tools. Pakistan has a great advantage. And that advantage is that we can create content for 80% less at times than what the rest of the world can create it for. Because, you know, we, we have the numbers. But, but we're not bridging these gaps. I mean, even as a business person, if I saw that opportunity, if I'm smart, I would avail that opportunity because that is the disruption that, I'm, that I can... I can I can instill and find, you know, an advantage in it. So I'll give you an example, right? Color correction, when you create content, color correction is one of the things that is part of your post-production. And even now, a lot of the ads that are made in Pakistan are going outside. They're going outside. Why can't we do something as basic as color correction, which just literally requires literally a couple of good, high quality systems and some resources with some training? See, I mean, Why? that's exactly, I mean, and, and we have pinpointed these problems. And one of the things that I'm working on is exactly what you said. I'm trying to see that if we can put a true post production facility, because why should we take all our films, all our commercials, and get them done outside? If what's the can... barrier to that? Is it, a, is it an economic barrier? Does the math not add up? Like, what's the issue? No, I think the math is everything is there. I, first of all, I think it's its lack of understanding information and what to to procure in order to be able to do that. That's, that's one side of it. <laughs> 
Secondly, I think one of one of the things that us Pakistanis need to get out of uh, the mindset is that we need Part to be innovators. We need to be innovators. We right. what we end up doing is to you know, let's be honest. We end up trying to use tried and true methods that others have used, which is fine. You're just a cog in the wheel then. But in order to chart our way, we need to be brave. And in and, and, and that, in that, you know, in that way of doing things, you, you can actually create advantage for yourself. You see, but you're seeing that on the music side, right? Like you're getting a lot yes. of these young emerging yes. artists that are fusing Eastern and Western sounds and creating something very unique. You're getting brands that are monetizing music and music platforms and proliferating music. Why is it that that's not happening on the content side? Is it that people are scared that social stigma or cultural values will be challenged it's, by the it's, younger generation? It's, 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 but it's so a, what? I mean, we've got YouTube it's views that are challenging. I, it's I'm a mixture of that. Yeah, I, I think it's a mixture of it. And and I'll give you an example. I, I produced an act in a film lately, which Unfortunately, Pakistan decided that it is against the Pakistani values. What right? are those values? That, that's exactly... Let's <laughs> right? the, this particular movie was about the issues and the, the trials and tribulations of expats who are right. living outside the country. Now, that's, right. a legitimate, that's a legitimate dialogue and discussion that we can have. But there, there are... There are restrictions being imposed without having a clear strategy, without defining what are we calling Pakistani? What are we calling non-Pakistani? What are we calling Muslim? What are we calling non-Muslim? So there is that side to it. On the flip side of it is again, the question of safety. So a lot of content makers here, people who are in, in positions of actually affecting change, mm -hmm. what they don't want to do is they don't want to rock the boat. Mm -hmm. Because once they rock the boat, the the revenue streams that they're that they have and the profits that they're making could could be affected, you know, in a negative way. True. So they want to keep they want to keep things at status quo. So it's, it's a like vicious cycle of content you talked about, right? <laughs> exactly. It's basically exactly. what works. Keep doing more of that. The yeah. consumer then does not know what else is out there. You continue right. making your money. You're stuck in this vicious trash. You know, vicious cycle. And also, I'm also seeing the people who have the platform here are also playing it safe. We all complain a lot that things are not changing here. But when it comes to us, people who are blessed with the ability to create change, we shy away because it might, it might as I said earlier, because it might be a hit, hit to our wallet, right? So it's it's a vicious cycle, as you said. It's a vicious cycle, and, and we need to break it. Anything recently you've seen on the content side that really struck you? Coming out of, let's say, Pakistani talent, Pakistani artists? Yes. I, I See, I, as you said, what I'm seeing is that there's a lot of great stuff happening, which is almost underground. You know, uh, why did our music scene do better? Because... You know, there were there were there were efforts made. You know, like Nescafe Basement, uh, Coke Studio, you know, other other venues like that. You know, the ability to to encourage new fresh blood to come in and give them the opportunity to expand our our menus. That's I think that's the biggest problem in Pakistan. That we do great work, but our menus are limited. Mm -hmm. We're not expanding our menus. And especially in film and television, because the producing a song, if you look at it from the business perspective, is much cheaper than producing a movie. True, that's true. Right. So, so people, people, and, and understandably so, they they get scared. Man, you know, if I do this, how am I going to feed my kids? Right. You know. So, so there is there is. We also need to incentivize people. You know. But I, it's going to take a while because I think, like in Pakistan, we've called Pakistani film industry in a revival, mm. right? But what is that revival? Let's be very honest about that. A lot of that revival is actually trying to do with what a certain neighbor country of ours, which where we, 
whose content we watch very eagerly, we are trying to we are trying to emulate. We are trying to copy. What I'm saying is that Pakistan and our artists, we need to create our own definitive voice. Iran has done that. Our other neighbors have done that. What is our true voice? What is our brand? What do we stand for? Interesting. And, and I think we haven't we haven't really defined that yet. I think we're in the process of it. Do you think that a piece of content like Cherelle's, which was a little controversial, is something like that, or you think that's too far on the on, on the liberal side? No, I, I think. Look, I think. I have always said that art is not there to give you answers. Art is there to provoke questions. You see? So controversy is nothing, there's nothing wrong with controversy because that's when dialogue starts. I'm not saying that it's right or wrong, but if there's controversy, then we can speak about it. We can be on the opposite sides of the same, of the same argument. That's fine. Right. But through that, through our conversation, we might find the, the true balance. But that's not where we're going right now. You know, we keep shying away from that. We keep emulating, we keep copying. And I would encourage our artists to take a braver step, which is happening. It is happening underground. There's, there's, I've seen some beautiful shorts done by just, you know, regular kids. But you look at it and you go, this is amazing stuff. They're also tackling issues. Sometimes they're social issues, sometimes they're political issues, sometimes they're cultural issues. Those are the kind of those are the kind of contents that we should be looking at. You can make that con content interesting enough. Because again, let's go back to the idea that you mentioned something storytelling. And the truth is that if I was to ask many people, what was your favorite book? Or what what thing kind of really affected you? deeply. Hardly it'll ever be introduction to physics, introduction to economics. It'll be it'll be some some story, some novel that they read, some poem that they read, some film that they saw. So, so there is an ability in storytelling to reform, to to encourage, and to create moments where we can have these conversations. And as long as there are dialogue and not two monologues trying to sit on top exactly. of each other. Exactly. Exactly. I'm going to move to my last question. You're someone who's followed his passion, and you come from a family of uh, a family of artists of three generations, and you followed your passion in a fairly structured manner. You went and studied it uh, extensively at some of the best colleges in the world. For those individuals who want to follow their passion, you know, it's always in your in your family might have been different, but for a lot of people to follow passion is is difficult because the families may not permit, the society may not accept, mm -hmm. or the situation just may not present itself where you succeed. Yeah. How do you continue motivating yourself through those down periods? Can, can mm, you give me an that's, example? That's a very interesting question. I'll give an example. I, you know, you, you spoke of my family, and I, I'm very blessed, the family that I come from, because the conversations in our house were amazing. They were all about film, television, literature. You know, I didn't choose it, but I happened to be part of the family, so it became part of my DNA. But at the same time, when I wanted to become an artist, you know, I wrote to my father, my family, that this is what I wanted to do. And my feeling was that they were, they, were, they were going to go rah, 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 go do it, you know. But my father kept asking me a very simple question, which was, why? Why do you want to do it? And I will tell you, this, this went on for years, and it frustrated me to no end. But in retrospect, what it did was, it made me really do some soul searching. Why am I doing it? Am I doing it to, to get attention? Am I doing it because it feeds me personally, spiritually on the inside? Am I mm -hmm. doing it? You know, so I needed to be very clear. And what I found was that my priorities and my reasons for doing that are, are also evolving as I grow older. My, my reasons for doing it might change. So the, the, the thing that I have done with me is 
that the reason that I tried to go to the best colleges that I could I could find was because I wanted to turn as many no's into yeses. Mm -hmm. Right. I if as a Pakistani, you know, Lahori guy going to, to Los Angeles or whatever, mm -hmm. there are things which which they will they will say, well, you know, you don't have enough training. You can't do Shakespeare. You can't right. you can't do accents. So my so my thinking was that okay, let me go get the training. I can do Shakespeare and I can do it quite well, thank you very much. You know, I can do accents. So I, I wanted to level the playing field as much as I possibly can. But, and at the same time, there are certain things that I can't change and I don't want to change. The color of my skin, my faith, where I come from, Pakistan is part of me. Right. I don't have to, I don't have to make excuses for it. I have to embrace it. I have to celebrate it. I have to be the ambassador of who I am, of, of where I come from. So these things, what I tried to do was, and when I teach, I, I start my my semester with this, right? that you could be very talented, but you also have to learn how to live the life of an artist. And what is that? Which is, which is what? Yes. Which is to be able to deal with your successes, with humility and grace, and accept your failures or your defeats with grace, and bravery and something that i always used to t tell my students is that look when and this is true for for literally any anything that we do and and when you go to an interview they can only accept or reject you from the piece of your life that has been exposed to them they cannot reject all of you because they don't know all of you so you have to find those tools to, to somehow the other secure and, and nourish your core and not lose sight of what you want to do. Yes, we can have high dreams, but we should also be prepared to take the pains and do the work that's necessary to achieve your dream. I can have a great dream, but it's still a dream if I'm not doing the work for it, right? So those are the kind of things that we, we have to look at and prepare ourselves and the people who are in the industry. Mm -hmm. How to deal with rejection, how to deal with something my father said to me again once when I, when I started this. He said, you know what? I don't know if you have talent or not, but just remember one thing, that in this business, success and failure both can ruin you mm. if you're not grounded. That's true. And, you know, it's funny as you say all of this, it is so exactly applicable to the life of an entrepreneur Absolutely. looking to build a business because you're doing that because it is only that which drives you. Like it is only that that success can kill you where you sort of get caught up in your excesses and the exuberance in your success exactly. and exactly. failure if you are unable to lift yourself back up and keep chugging at it can kill you too. I think it's it's an interesting parallel you draw. I've never really looked at it that way. Uh, but yeah. the artist and the entrepreneur are, are creators yeah. in a sense. Exactly. I mean, we are, we are not very different. Yeah. I mean, the, the product that we are creating might be different, but I think the journey and the experience, there's a lot that we can share. And I've done that with, with CEOs of companies where let's demystify these things and find the common ground. Right. We have similar challenges, but just just put in a different frame. Again, a universal story, but put in a different frame. A different frame. <laughs> a different exactly. Frame. Yeah. Exactly. This was amazing, Farhan. Thank you so much for the time. I appreciate the the candid discussion, the feedback on on your journey, on sort of everything. Um, I wish you all the best. I know you're in Pakistan right now. I hope you're able to get something interesting off the ground that will shape the lives of future talent in this country. And I think that uh, whatever we can do to assist in helping build a new narrative, our own narrative, I think is the right approach, as you said. Look, I, I am extremely humbled and, and, and grateful that we got a chance to talk.
And yes, I think these are the conversations and these are the kind of forums that we do need to create. So that, again, the idea is, the reason I've come back to Pakistan and, and I'm spending considerable time here is because, yes, I've done decently well, but if I don't share this and if I don't learn from here, then I'm doing a disservice to who, who I am. Right. It's not just about me making riches. It is also for me to share and learn from, from people here and together keep on trying to improve things the best we can. You know, and that doesn't mean that I need to see the effect of every change in my lifetime. I can, I can, I can sow the seed, and maybe the next generation or my my grandchildren might see the the benefit of it. So yeah, Absolutely. that's the struggle that we have. But thank you so much. I really appreciate having this conversation. Hopefully, we can have it again, and maybe we can keep on having it off screen, you and me. Absolutely, absolutely. We will do that. We will do that. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Uh, episode 12 of Digitales. We will see you in the next one. All right. Bye-bye.